Good afternoon, everybody. Um, <laughs> my name is Chris Chong, and I'm the, uh, the, the director at the ESV Center. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our next installment of the EUSME Center webinar series. Uh, and today's webinar is going to be on how to tap into China's uh, green building sector, which is a, a huge opportunity, we think, for many European SMEs. Um, the first thing I'd like to do, though, before we start, is to just do some typical admin procedures that we will do for most of these webinars, or for, or for all of these webinars. So, um, first of all, if, uh, if you want to submit any questions uh, during the webinar, then please feel free to do so in the box, as indicated on this slide. Um, and so during the presentation, if you want to ask a question, our staff will field the question, and we'll do our best to answer them as quickly as possible. Um, the next thing to note is that uh, the ESME Center um, has or will be recently publishing a green, uh, green building report. And so much of the information uh, in this presentation is based on this report um, as well. Just to give you some background information, which is also highlighted in the report, this uh, sector is absolutely huge. Um, in a previous uh, construction sector webinar that uh, we have uh, previously, previously broadcast, um, Dirk Lehrman, our expert today, mentioned that uh, China was building housing area the size of Rome every two weeks, just to give us an indication of the, the huge size of construction that's taking place here. And obviously, that has a huge impact in terms of environment and in terms of energy consumption. This is uh, uh, obviously something that's been noticed by the Chinese government, and they're trying very hard to um, improve the environmental situation here. And this is indicated in the 12 5 year plan. Uh, and they have targets set, which are very ambitious, ambitious, for example, of having 1 billion meters squared of green buildings by the end of 2015, and 20% of new construction should meet the green building standard by the end of 2015 as well. Uh, and so all of these um, statistics and information and uh, the outline of the opportunities and challenges are also outlined in this green building report, which will be published next week, sorry, which will be published on September the 12th. Now the author of the report uh, and of our previous construction report is Mr. Dirk Lerimans and today he'll be introducing you more concretely uh, through the opportunities and challenges of doing business in the green building sector. So Dirk if I can hand over to you please take it away. Thank you Chris. Good morning in Europe and um, good afternoon in China and good night wherever else you may be. Um, thank you Chris. Concretely is indeed the, the correct <laughs> word in, um, in, in building environment. We took our time to pick that joke up. Uh, <laughs> we rehearsed it five times at least. It's still uh, good. It's still great. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, you can't see the public laughing. So yes. it's, it's not as funny as it should be. Yes. Um, okay, today, today's topic is, is, is green building. We had a, we had a seminar on, on building earlier uh, in which we saw that the building market is huge but that the Chinese companies are actually taking the lion's share um, of that whole building market and that Western companies had to be happy with a few percentages, few slivers, few niches, uh, high-tech niches and specialty niches that the Chinese couldn't do themselves. Uh, green building as, as a sub-segment of building, however, is, is showing a bit of a different picture. Um, it, it is not as massive as the building itself but if we may believe what the government is planning with it, then it will become a massive uh, market within a few years and still everything, every market share, every technology, every place is still to be open for grabs. Which means, and we'll see that later in the seminar, there is still a lot, a lot, a lot to do and there's lots of market to be growing. So it seems like we're going to the whole process of the China booming all over again in this green market, which is actually a fun process to do. Yep. So we're actually at the right time, um, the right time to discuss market entry, because now is kind of, and we'll see that later again in the seminar, now is kind of the time to start really getting active in green building. Okay, maybe quick introduction uh, of myself. Yes, that's right. Um, I've, I've been in China for the last 14 years. I've been doing marketing and sales, plant management, mergers and acquisitions the last eight years in the construction industry in China, 
I've had my feet in the um, in the concrete uh, for the last eight years. I negotiated a good number of acquisition deals, so I've been running around quite extensively in the um, in, in in the building sector. And since 2011, I, 2011, I, I left great corporate. I got a bit bored with PowerPoint. I thought maybe there's something more to do in webinars and things like that. <laughs> Um, so I left the company, started my own consultancy, and we are specializing, as you could imagine, in, in construction, in green building, uh, and also in food. Food has nothing to do with green building, but um, the Chinese like to have it safe and green, so uh, somewhere there's a little bit of a connection. Okay, um, what are we going to do today? Uh, we're trying to give a little bit of a definition uh, of green building. Um, what are we talking about in China? How big is the market and how big is it going to be? The opportunity that we see and why there is an opportunity. And then of course um, there is no, no gain without pain. What are the challenges and, and, and how would we suggest to go about getting into the Chinese market? Um, below are two examples of, of, of Chinese building. One is well, quite literally green. The other one is, is also from a um, from an institute who is there to investigate investigate green building. Um, this is not your typical green building. Where, where are they? This is typical. This is typical um, of of some architectural feats that, mm. that uses green building as a as a feature. But I would say ninety nine point eight percent of the green buildings just look like other buildings. And <clears throat> contrary to what my thought, what my daughter thought, they are not necessarily green from the Okay, so green building, um, try to make a definition is not always easy. Again, it's not a building which is painted green. Uh, most of the green buildings, you don't see it from the outside. You just see downstairs in the, in the lobby, you would see a plate. This building has been built according to this and this standard, and you will pay a bit more rent, uh, sometimes a lot more rent, because it's a green building. Um, you could say that what is what is green building in itself? Well, the definition is there: um, a building that reduces um, or even makes to zero the environmental impact of the building. I mean, that's the big goal. That's where we want to go. Um, buildings that do not consume energy, that do not pollute, uh, that do not produce noise, that do not not produce wastewater, that create their own energy, that save their own energy that are very healthy for the people to live in, and you can have a hundred more criteria um, what a green building should be. Uh, but of course, it has to be translated in what actually is defined as a green building in statistics, and, 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 and when do you call a building green? So, um, I think this is a good point, actually, uh, Dirk, if we can uh, just take a quick poll, just to get an idea of who the audience is and uh, what their backgrounds are. Um, so right now, everybody, I'm just about to launch a poll, and uh, the question will be who is active in which sector in terms of products, services, energy. And if you could just uh, give your answers very quickly, and then we'll share the answers with everybody. So here you go, just launching the poll. And okay, now I'm going to close the poll. And share the results with everybody. So as, as we can see from the results, 35% uh, of the participants today are in the services sector, 25% yeah. uh, in, in, in the products, 20% in energy, and 20% not in the sector. Um, does that kind of reflect, do you think, the, uh, the market at the moment in terms of Foreign companies in the market. Well, it is of course it, it is a little bit surprising to me uh, that services are taking such a high percentage right. of the people here, um, because green building, of course, is considered is consisting of three three issues. You have got the whole people that supply products to a green building, right. uh, people that supply the services around defining it, checking it, and, 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 and maybe 
revamping it or whatever, and the people that have to do around the energy. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see there's a lot of service, service around it, uh, people interested in, in supplying services. Uh, it's much more difficult to define here yeah. uh, because Chinese are not really used to what our service is worth to us. Right. Um, much less than products which they can take in their hands and, and, and value. Um, but it's good to knew, know that a lot of people are into services and uh, probably later in the, in the seminar we will then um, get some more attention to what exactly what's, what the opportunities are for, for service companies. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Doug. And uh, if we can now move on with the presentation. Good. So, um, Green building again, there is a regulation that defines how, how is green building called and then you talk about certif certification where in China you've got two, two standards fighting each other. Right. That's the American LEED standard who has been introduced uh, a number of years ago yeah. and the Chinese government who was not too happy with American standards right. thought they could do a better job and then issued their own standards uh, to which their buildings are now being built. Now have a look at, at, at the market size. Um, this, this is kind of a standard Chinese Chinese start charge. It all goes up and up and up and up. Um, you will see the green building area of the building area uh, in, in billion square meters. Um, now a billion square meters is difficult to define uh, and even in number of football fields it would be a, a big number. But um, Chinese market is huge. It is, it is about 55% of the world market still at this moment and still growing. So from a, from a possibility kind of view, um, the Chinese construction market is big and will remain to grow you know, according to, I would say, most of the statistics. What you will see here uh, is, is, is the, green, the green area still growing in 2009, 2000 and 2011. But traditional building here, here in the Grunen slide will kind of stagnate. Yeah. Yeah. While all the growth should be taken up by green buildings. So by buildings that, in one way or another, adhere to one of the two green building standards. Um, and the, the government is hoping to achieve that um, within within less than ten years. Again, this graph is given by the Chinese government. Now, so the Chinese government is kind of predicting, is kind of promoting and hoping that it will work, will, will work out like this. Yep. Um, analysts are a bit, more, a bit more conservative, but if the government gets its way, you will see that about 25% of the buildings in 2020 will be green buildings. And that means you're talking about 1 to 1.5 billion square meters of green building. That's an awful lot of services, that's an awful lot of products that go in there. So even if the government doesn't achieve it that, le that level, yeah, it shows how fast this market is and will be growing in the next few years. Not surprisingly, um, you will see that the um, green buildings at this moment are, are in the most developed area. You know, if, if, if you've got too much money and you, don't, you do care about, about the greenness of the building, if you're just struggling to make ends meet at the end of the month, you're not too concerned about how green your building is at the end of the day. Right. And that shows, of course. Yeah, you see Guangdong, uh, Shanghai, Jiangsu, Beijing, not surprisingly the most uh, developed and most rich areas right. where people um, want to show more than just, I make a building, I make a nice building. No, no, I make a green building. Uh, it's also the place of the government, of course. Government buildings are very strongly promoted now, green building. So it is not surprising that, again, like in most of the other products, the, the, the oil starts in, 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 in the developed centers and then will spread out over time to the rest of the country. So if you're hurrying up to uh, come to China, well, go to the traditional places, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangdong, you will not be not too far off where the action is. So China is actually um, now in, in a struggle. Um, there is two green building standards fighting for attention. 
you've got the American LEED um, standard, uh, which has been introduced by, how could you almost guess, uh, American building companies um, in, uh, in 2000. Uh, a good number of, of buildings have been built, especially Western companies, who wanted to use government, their own policies also in China. Uh, they built according to LEED. Um, the European standard, unfortunately, for us Europeans, is nowhere to be seen. Right. Yeah. So, as a green building um, provider of services, products, or whatever, if your products are geared up for European standards, be it the British or other European standards, uh, you will not find them in China. So, you either have to convert to the Americans, or even better, I would say, to, um, to make sure that your product place into the Chinese three-star green building. Is there a big difference in mentality between uh, the two different standards? It's not massively different. Um, it, it just, it's a bit a little bit of, of different approach where um, in, in the one system you have to get points. Uh, the American lead system gives you points okay. um, where you have, the more points you have, the, the higher you get in, 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 into the level of the lead, while the, the three star basically gives tick marks. If you tick all the marks for a building from one star, you get a one star. If you tick all of them for two star, you get a two star, and so on. Um, it makes it easier, for example, for a lead building to upgrade. Okay. Yeah, so a lead building could be upgraded from, from a certified building to a silver or gold building later because you add points which is much more difficult in the, uh, in the Chinese system. Um, but the Chinese system, of course, you know from the front where you start. Uh, do I go for a one-star building or two-star building or three-star building? Okay. And depending on that, uh, you will need to make your whole design from, from zero. LEED is much more open to, to, to change designs uh, and, and to add points, while the three-star is much more from the beginning that's, that's, that's the one you go for. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, there is, there is different areas uh, in, which, in which they play. Um, you, you cannot certify all of the areas. Okay. So there are different weights being placed on, 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 for example, water management or energy management or material use, or for example, um, the fact that you, you recuperate the, the material. So the weights are a lot different. That has, of course, an effect on all the services and materials that go in. Yeah, if, if one system um, heavily weights on the, the fact that your material, when the building is broken down, can be used again, and the other not, if your product strong point is my material can be used again, well, forget about the three star, yeah, uh, because it, it, it's not in their scope. Uh, and that's why it's important for, for, for every green building provider to know um, how strong its product or services place into these standards, how strong it can actually help the building owners to achieve their standards. Because your product may be as green and as efficient and as nice and as fabulous as it may be, if you don't score points in, in, in any of these green building labels, right. you could just as well not exist. And that's the importance, of course, of knowing that the standards are there and, and, and what role you can play in them. This is a bit of the history. Um, you will see the two lines. The, the dark green line is the number of three-star um, buildings uh, according to the, the three-star three um, Chinese, standard. Chinese standards. And then you've got the Americans who have been there a little bit earlier, 2004. But you also see they just start to be picking up. Um, people that are familiar with the S-curve, which is the next, which is the next slide, okay. you will see that this represents basically that the really upstart, the really ramping up uh, of this green building. For people that are more in flight mode, the flight has just left the tarmac okay. after four or five years of, of taxiing and runway. So you can really see that since two or three years, green building is taking off. Uh, and will perform um, uh, an S-shaped form okay. in the next five, five to ten years. And, and just to clarify, the three star, that's the lowest rank of the, uh, the, the Chinese standard? No, three stars three star is the highest, is the highest, okay. is the highest. 
Okay, there again, I mean, what you see in, in the previous slides is that uh, according to the normal S-curve theory, your, your product is taking off. Green building is very definitely at the beginning of the S-curve. If you would put the government numbers, uh, if you would put the present statistics, you would more or less come to this S-curve. Um, and, 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 and for everybody who wants to enter markets, this is kind of the sweet spot, like right. we'll see later. Um, if you want to get into China, now is exactly the right time. The market is there, the market is starting up, it hasn't formed yet, everything is still to be done, everybody is looking for technology, it's the right time to get in. Okay. So, a bit of a SWOT, um, a SWOT analysis for, for European companies who do, what, who do want to get into China, into green building. Um, strengths are relatively evidently, we have, they don't. Um, Europe has been working on green buildings for the last 20 years. Norms have gotten stricter and stricter every year. Mm. Um, I know in our country, in Belgium, that, that the norms are getting so strict that um, houses almost become passive. Yeah. Okay. Virtually no energy consumption. So we've had at least 5 or 10, maybe 15 years of development um, into developing these technologies, which we have today, which right. we use, which we know the, which we know the result of, none of them has been used in China. You've seen that it's only for the last two, three years that building are being certified. Um, that technology is still coming in. There's still a lot of movement. Uh, people are trying out and so on. But we've been able to develop those technologies. Okay. Um, so there is a lot of demand. There's a lot of companies here who really want to get into the market, but looking for technology, looking for European partners. So we have, and basically they don't yet. Yeah. Don't wait five years. If we can just dig a bit further, um, I mean obviously you're saying that there's huge opportunities here, but as you mentioned in one of your first slides, there's many products and different services that um, there'll be opportunities for. Um, obviously um, the opportunities will not be the same for all these products and services. So are there any things in particular, examples, that stand out for you as being particular opportunities um, in, in this present market? Well, well, we'll come back to that in, uh, in, in one of the later, okay. in one of the later, later slides, Chris. Um, there, there, is, there is opportunities where in the beginning of the market uh, there will be a lot of demand, but very much depend really on, on how you want to enter the market. Um, for most of green building products and, and services, there would be an opportunity okay. at this moment. Um, and also, not, not only we have the technology as companies in Europe, but the fact that it's made in Europe gives you an enormous advantage on this Chinese market. Um, green building is more expensive. They are prepared to pay money for it. And if you come with the made in, made in Europe label, don't stop producing it in China immediately. Uh, you will get a premium. Um, so there is a strong point, there is an opportunity, it is the ideal time on the S-curve. We will see growth rates of 30-40% per year right. for at least the next 3-4 years. 30-40%? Yeah. 30-40% to, 40%. 30 to 40 right. in, many, in many of these areas. I mean, this is, this, is, this is growth rate where many sectors and many companies can only dream of. Yes. But this is where you are positioned at this moment uh, on the S-curve. Um, now, you can discuss whether it will be 25 or 35 or 40 but it will not be two. Okay. Yeah. So if there is a market, it's here. It's also technology and brand market, which means no mass, no mass market, no, you, you can really work for premium, uh, get your price out here. It, it's about marketing, not about, not about price. And there's a lot of Chinese partners who are really dying to find the right partner in Europe. So if you don't want to do it yourself, um, finding a partner is not that difficult. On the other hand, of course, it's in China. You have Chinese competition doing competing the Chinese way, which is not fair, uh, which is never fair. But that, that's how it is. If you can't handle that, stay out of the way. Um, and of course, copying is always one of the first questions you get, whether or not you should get into the Chinese market. Okay. And you talk a bit more about IP challenges then? Uh, yes, a little bit. But there again, there's, there's a lot of people here uh, in the EUSME Center or in the IP center that can help on IP That's right. and, and, and develop the, the right strategy. 
So, where's the opportunity, Chris? And, and here I come back Sorry, to, your, to, to your question. Yeah, exactly. You're a little bit too fast <laughs> in asking the question. Um, where, where do we see really opportunities in, in products? Uh, construction elements. Um, construction elements that, let's say, put things together. Um, we're going away from a just pouring concrete and putting steel. We're going much more to, to, to the Lego um, approach to things. So people doing construction elements uh, should benefit from that. Of course, high-tech energy consumers. Uh, LED is, is definitely one, one that's picking up here. Uh, but there's a lot of heating systems that, that we use in, in Europe that, that they're now trying to implement. Um, boilers, gas, whatever, there's, 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 there's many technologies that have not been in China and now start to be implemented. Uh, insulation techniques, of course they have insulation, and again the bulk of the insulation is a Chinese market. But there is a lot and lot and lot of niche products, uh, especially fire retard and those kind of places, where, um, where the Chinese have not been very attentive uh, and where there's a lot of niches to be discovered here in China. I mean, would you say there's still um, a bias towards passive solutions over active solutions? For example, uh, insulation walls, uh, which are lower cost. And I've, I've read in, in recent research that uh, because of the cost elements and you know, uh, many developers are not willing to pay a premium for green building, that they're, they're, they're going for green building, but really they're talking about passive solutions over active solutions such as um, uh, ventilation and, uh, and heating uh, solutions. Do you, do you have a feel for that kind of trend? Well, developers are almost by definition, definition a conservative bunch. Yep. That, is, that is the case in Europe and that is the case here too. Um, however, competition is getting stiff. Okay. Um, there's a lot of, lot of government pressure and in the sense if you're not able to build a green building, well, your chances on getting land and hence an opportunity to develop uh, will be greatly, greatly diminished. So, so in that sense, um, there is a huge pressure uh, against this, this, this safe. Uh, on, the other, on the other hand, of course, developers are only human. Yeah. Uh, if they can reduce costs uh, and with reduced costs get to the standards where they need to be, they will do so. Yeah? Uh, they will not try to be smarter than anybody else, they will not try to be holier than the Pope. Uh, and there again, the, the certification is basically the key. Yeah? Uh, developers will try to get certified in an as cheap as possible way. Uh, you may have niches where developers want to go beyond that for all kinds of reasons. But there again, your sweet spot should be in the place where you can help the developer achieve his, uh, his certification. Okay, on, on, on products again, building elements, coal bridges, at this moment almost none of the building is, is, is being equipped with coal bridges. Okay. Um, that kind, of, that kind of, of technologies, which we've been using for the last 20, 30 years at least, um, are now being introduced. Uh, water management, you know, where, where they used to have just the water throwing away, uh, but there's a lot of niches in, in that water management that, that can help. In servicing is retrofitting. Um, how can I take a building which is maybe only 10, 15 years old um, and make sure that it stop wasting energy? Um, I've, I've, seen, I've seen pictures, infrared pictures, uh, of buildings that are not even five years old and that are like red as a Christmas tree. Um, because for the last 20 years, nobody really, really paid attention to, to how does my building perform. So there's a lot of retrofitting that will need to be done. Uh, city development engineering, a lot of cities want to have a green city. So they're looking for people to help them develop that green city. Uh, calculation services, there's an awful lot of, 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 of services around um, that can be used. But again, Chinese market is not used to these services. Mm -hmm. So you will need a lot of, of, of push and a lot of energy to convince the market that you have that kind of services and why it's interesting for them. If you can prove that your service is helping them achieve the goals, you should have an easy right. Would you say that uh, developers in China are even more cost sensitive than in, in Europe? 
Um, yes and no. Um, less so than before. Okay. Uh, what you see is that because people start to be more quality sensitive, people start to be more um, environment sensitive, they have bought their first apartment and they've run into all the issues, that they start demanding from their second house and their second apartment okay. that the quality is better, that the environment is better, um, and they're increasingly willing to pay a premium for that. Uh, housing is getting so expensive here because of land value and land prices right. that actually the extra value to put on a comfortable house and a greenhouse comparison to the land prices and the whole project price gets less and less and less and less. So therefore customers are getting more demanding, uh, governments are getting more demanding and hence the price pressure is reducing and premium markets are opening up. Okay. So third, third level is of course energy. Um, you've got water, you've got energy, you've got You've got environment, you've got noise, uh, all, all these issues, but energy sticks out in any of them. Um, and any company that can, that can help and provide with, with generation systems or storage, yeah, heat pumps, geothermal systems, and so on, um, are, are, are really trying to find out what's their niche in the market. Same with ESCOs, energy service companies. They are now still focusing on industrial, but they're teasing and they're finding out how can we work into buildings? How can we invest certain equipment into a building and then collect the, the, the savings from that? Uh, there's lots of discussion uh, on those, on the policies, on, on, on leg legislation that should make that possible. And now it's time to get back to the audience and just to get some of your feedback in terms of, you know, where you see the major concerns are for, um, for you when you approach this market. So the question is, what is your biggest concern in, in China when approaching the green building sector? And um, I've just launched the, the poll, and I'd be grateful if you could all just click on the, uh, the answer that you think. And I'll just give you a few more seconds before I close the poll. And I'm just going to close it now and share the results. And as you can see here, Dirk, um, most people chose the major concern was regulation, and then the next one, corrupt practices. Uh, how does that fit in with your uh, view of, uh, of, the, of the industry? Of well, the I wouldn't say I'm surprised of this, um, right. because this is indeed the case in the general building market. Um, they have built the regulations in a way that, 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 that the locals are favored. Um, and of course the, local, the locals are using what we call corrupt practices. Um, money that gets under the table, purchasing people that, that, that get paid, design institutes that get paid to prescribe certain standards and norms. Um, so yes, uh, in, in the whole building industry, um, this is this is a correct correct analysis. Um, I'm I'm surprised to see a little bit also the, the low IP issues. Yeah. Um, that not too many people seem to be saying that's that's the major the major concern. Regarding building, I would very strongly agree with this analysis that indeed the regulation favors local. It is difficult to get in. Um, there is corruption practices and there is there is IP issues. Right. Um, regarding green building, I would be much more optimistic. Right. Um, because in green building, you, you're not competing on price, you're not competing head-on. Um, we're now in a stage that new technologies are being brought in. Yes. Yeah. Um, and comparing a new technology with, with something totally different existing is is, is not easy. So so. The issues at this moment are not as much the, the regulations, the corruption practices, um, or, or yet IP issues. Mm -hmm. The big thing is, how can I convince my market that my product is, is the correct one? Um, and how am I going to convince the market that my product is going to help them achieve what it is? 
um, we do have a techno technology, technological advantage um, that is not easily taken away by regulation that favors locals. Right. And I would even almost say on the contrary, the regulations, the push from the government to go for green government, yeah. um, favors outside suppliers because they are the only one that really can can deliver okay. uh, on what on what companies are looking for. So I, I would be a little bit more on the optimistic side on this one. Um, is that we do have know-how, we do have an advantage of an image of coming from Europe being quality, which the Chinese don't have. So in, in, in the area, in the arena of green building, yes, it seems we, we have some interesting weapons that the Chinese don't have. So a new um, brand is very marketable here in the green building sector. Uh, absolutely. I mean, if you have a, a strong brand in, in, in a green building thing at home, sure. um, uh, launching it here is, is, is the best thing you can do at this moment. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Okay, now the question of course is, there is the huge opportunity. Yes. There is no doubt about that. Um, that there, is, there, is, there is a market, um, I would say, that has never been seen before. Um, for SMEs that are used to, you know, European markets, which barely grow. Um, where if you talk about hundred thousands of square meters being built, it's already a big building. Um, we're talking about a market pool of billions. Yeah. It's like swimming in a swimming pool in the garden and then suddenly stepping out and seeing the ocean. Right. That doesn't mean that you should start swimming in the ocean without preparing a little bit. Um, the market is huge, um, the market grows, is fast. Uh, the demand is, 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 is enormous, um, but how do you approach it? Uh, and, and their green building market in China is not different from any other market in China. Yeah. Uh, despite the, the growth and despite the strong weapons we have, uh, the Chinese market remains a difficult nut to crack. Yeah. Yeah. So the advice is always, whether it's green building or, or, or any other building, whether you have fanciest product in town or not, um, the advice is always do the homework correctly. Yeah. So in, in my advice to customers, I always say, look, you go for know-how. You don't go for price. Don't try to do to, to head-on head head, head, head on competition with Chinese. You really have to play on a quality level. Yeah. Uh, play on the niche, on the brand, on the know-how. These are the three, the three, you three queen um, chess pieces that you really have to use um, mm -hmm. and do your homework on. Yeah. Know which things you know that's knowing in the market. Compare this with the, with, the, with the standards. Does my product indeed help the standard or should I repack, revamp, reorganize um, the product offering, uh, product offering? So that, that's the first thing you do before you, you let salespeople run around with your solution is um, really do the homework on the know-how, the brand and the niche. Um, next to that, yeah, the, the second big element of the strategy is your partnership strategy. Um, as big as China is, you will need partners. Um, now partners, again, can be a bit more creative than what it used to be. Um, it could be Chinese distributors. It could be Chinese companies who want to produce your product and sell it. But if you're a bit more creative, it could also be other Western European companies. Right. Yeah? And, and that's a strategy that, that I would really recommend to look at also. Uh, clustering solutions of different European companies. Mm -hmm. that together form a total puzzle or a total solution to a certain thing. So you may have product A, but product A needs an environment of B, C and D. Yeah. Yeah. It makes little sense that your salesman is going to run around with product A, somebody else is running around with product B, product C hasn't come yet and product D is still in the investigation phase. Yes. Yeah. Um, somewhere you have to go to the market with a solution. So in some circumstances, it might not be a bad idea to sit together with A, B, C and D 
yes. in, your, in, your, in your home country, in Europe, and say, why wouldn't we set up a sales organization together to sell our whole concept? Yeah. And that, that's something that, that, especially in green building, may actually strengthen um, the position of SMEs. Yes. And you, you might actually get, get much faster into the market because you're coming with a solution, not with a product. Yes. I think it's one of the characteristics of the market that um, there are not that many integrators from what I've heard in terms of integrated solutions. And that's been one of the challenges for green building technologies as well. So it makes, I think, uh, absolute sense if foreign companies can band together to put together this the integrated solution for the market. Well, absolutely. Uh, mo most smaller companies in Europe have an interesting, have an interesting technology. Right. Uh, also have the, the, the experience um, to sell that technology in the market that they know and the market where it is. To give a very small example, you may have a great product in a, a, villa, a villa or a bungalow in Europe. Yes. Yeah. But here they're not building villas and bungalows. They're building 50-story, 80-story buildings. Right. Yeah. So you will need to have a product adaptation. Yes. You will need to adapt your technology. You may need to work together with other companies that do similar things or other things um, before you say, well, this is what we're going to do in the Chinese market. Yes. So in that sense, your homework should also be done a little bit at home um, in the sense that find the Chinese market, see if your product is, is available or your service yeah. uh, works at home and, and, and start thinking, um, is my or service offering, my product offering suited for sales or should I package it in another way or with other companies in a total solution. And that, that's where the partnerships come in, of course. Um, that can be also here. It may well be that your product, to sell it as product A to the market is hugely difficult. But if you sell it to a company that produces B and C and D and is integrated, yeah, um, it might be a much faster way into the market. But then finding the right company that does B, C and D yeah. and will not run away with your A, yeah, that's, the, <laughs> that's always the risk, um, is, um, is important. So b before you start rushing and then starting the plane to take one of the multiple seminars or webinars or meetings that are now being done on green building, um, there's a good number of people that I would suggest you to talk to. Um, there's a lot of people that, that have experience and that basically will be able to, um, to give you good advice. There is, there is a good number of, um, of European initiatives. Um, people that know about companies looking for certain technologies. Right. Um, the EU SME is, is one of them. Um, there, is, there is another, the EC2, an Italian, an Italian initiative. I mean, there is, there is a handful of, of initiatives Europe, supported by Europe that are busy with this subject. Yes. Um, they have contact in the markets. They are very open for visits. Uh, take the plane, go and see them, discuss what the story is. Uh, another very interesting area I always find is the green building um, <clears throat> industrial zones. Every city that's a little bit um, uh, that's a little bit uh, advanced wants to make a new industrial zone with something green in there. Uh, and some choose a green technology, this or that. Some people call call it green building industrial zones. Um, this is a place where you can get investment subsidies land for free for, for a certain, certain area. You can use this demonstration area, which is crucial if you want to put a new technology in the market. You can do trial projects uh, at a relatively low cost, yeah, which allows you <clears throat> to show your customers or your future customers, look, we're doing this and this and that. It has been implemented in these and these and these buildings, and this is the result, yeah. which is key for any new technology to get into the market. Um, the third key kind of people you should talk to, of course, developers. They are logically a part of your market research. You should ask them, well, this technology, do you see any future or whatever? But also for potential partners. A lot of the developers have actually gone downstream, uh, have invested in companies that do provide solutions. Um, and they might even be saying, well, you know what, me as a developer, I'd like to go downstream in a... In a, in a in an industry that does this, this, this and that. 
um, and coming with the right technology in the right place might actually um, not be a bad idea. And then what I came back for last time is, is other Western companies. There's a lot of people that are already here that sell system solutions uh, and so on. So the whole idea is try to find a way that you do not sell a product. Right. Try to sell a system solution, maybe even maintenance afterwards in, in, in the whole package. Uh, guarantee certain number of, of outputs or whatever what you're doing. Um, cluster, yeah, uh, and, and share together. Yeah, there's a lot of companies now trying to go in, setting up one or two salespeople, and they all run around the same design institute, same building industrial zones, and so on. It might make sense for three or four SMEs that know each other and that complement each other to set up a common, a common sales office. Uh, it would reduce cost dramatically, and as a salesman, you can go, and if customer doesn't need scenario A, product A, solution A, well, then you still have product B to sell. Um, so that was what I, what I would advise, especially for SMEs that are not big enough to immediately start opening offices with four or five people, cluster, work together. And so now we're talking about some of the challenges that you know these SMEs might face when they come here and how to overcome them. Yeah, so um, people that have been following the last webinar yes, may recognize <laughs> yes, may may recognize this slide, and and it's quite quite simple um, because the, the the risk and the challenges of getting here are exactly the same, whether it's street building or building or whether it's bicycles or cups or services, architectural services. Um, it's always the same. Going into China is needs needs a long profit horizon. Yeah, don't think you will get cash out of China within three years. Yeah, choose the right moment on the S curve, which, in terms of green building, is now. Yeah. Uh, do a lot of work on the on the partner. Right. Yeah, finding him. Um, do a little bit more than just bumping into someone of a fair. Uh, do a bit of homework. Make, make lists, go and talk to many people, uh, invite them over. Perhaps you can talk a bit more about that actually, about how, how you find out more about the, the partner and their background. How, how do you know, you know, um, how do you gather the information in which you can base a, a trusting business relationship? Well, there is no better thing than, of course, meeting him, and, and more than once, preferably, in different environments. Sure. Yeah. But then, I mean, apart from your own personal connections, um, a little bit of due diligence is not that difficult. Yes. Yeah. Does he work with other partners? Well, yes. Call them. Go and meet them. How did how did you work with this guy? What are the issues? What are the unalignments? Um, check his customers. Check his projects. Yes. Uh, just don't believe what he says. If he says I've done I've done three million and my customer is BASF and is this and this and this and that, well, call BASF. Yes. Well, have someone call them. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it wouldn't be the first time that that a few simple calls. Have Basic due diligence takes out ninety percent of the of the problems. If if a Chinese company works through your basic due diligence, the chances are already very high that it's a decent company. Sure. Um, so so for me, I mean, finding it, doing more homework than just bumping into someone on a fair, make long list, have some Chinese person go on the internet, find people, check their um, business license. Check their business license in, in second phase. Um, just do a bit of market research. Do homework. Sure. Yeah. Like you would do in Europe. Don't just estimate that the first guy you meet on a on a fair is the right partner for you. Sure. And somebody actually asked a question about carrying out due diligence, and um, I think a great report that the US and the Center has written is called uh, "Knowing Your Partner in China," and that outlines a, a very structured process for how to carry out due diligence on your partners in China. And that is downloadable from our website. Yeah, it, it's not rocket science. Yeah, um, it's not rocket science. Um, the problem is a lot of people think it's not possible, so I will just uh, rely on my own personal judgment, meeting and talking to him, um, and see what happens. But I mean, the the, the due diligence is due diligence of a person uh, is a relatively straightforward process. It has a number of of of, of boxes that need to be ticked. And it doesn't cost an arm and a leg, either to do it yourself or to have someone uh, do it for you. And it can save you years of, of frustration um, and, and basically a stolen market. Yes. 
So timing is important, part is important, your business model is important in the sense that you will not be able to copy paste. Most companies take two, sometimes three, or maybe never find it, a business model that works. You need to have the core, but you will need to adapt your product, your service offering, the way how you get paid, um, the way how you pay your distributors or whatever. It will be different and it will take time. Um, also there, avoid the business culture. Uh, paying your way uh, in brown envelopes is not the right way to get into China. Sure. Um, you will be faster out than in. Um, and if it would be successful, uh, it will probably not, not be for very long because Chinese competitors are much, much better in playing this game than you will ever be. So don't even try to beat them on their own game. And also prepare plan Bs. I mean, this is my business model, this is what I go for. If it doesn't work in, in six, 12 months here, 12 months time, well then let's start something else and be prepared, be prepared to do that. So that's the three areas that are crucial uh, in any kind of market entry. And then of course, rich, rich, uh, risk management. Uh, uh, atmosphere changes in government can have a huge impact on the market. Do your homework, IP homework, um, it's not that difficult. Uh, there is a lot of institutions here again that give you guidelines. Um, there's a lot of people that say, well, I will not register my brand because they will copy it anyway. Uh, these kind of, of reasonings make it very difficult. Uh, they do copy, but that doesn't give you any excuse not to, um, not to register your name. And again, avoid, avoid gliding into price competition. You need to, to really focus on your product, the added value. Um, and if you're going, again, play on their turf, you will lose. And just to remind everybody of the... Uh EU project which uh, handles inquiries and questions regarding RPR. That's the IPR SME Help Desk uh, and their uh, website is iprsmehelpdesk.eu. Good. Again, what I always uh, advise my customers, um, if you go to market, do your homework, uh, check where the market is, either do it yourself or have somebody else do it. Um, go for a business model that may not be the same as yours. Do a decent partner search not just the first guy you bumped into and then in, into the last fair um, implementation and active follow-up by the company. You need to be involved as a manager. It's always the same five, five basic building steps of which we see in most of the failed companies that number one and number two have been kind of forgotten. Right. Yeah. If, if your market research is, is one guy coming over on a trip for five days and he thinks he knows the market, well, that doesn't work. Um, but market, uh, entering, entering the Chinese market is, is not a guaranteed success, yeah. but there is a number of, of steps which you should follow um, to make sure that you maximize your chances, and chances are. Any suggestion summary? Okay, summary, uh, it's uh, exciting market, yeah. it's an infancy, um, the little baby starts to walk or the, the plane starts to fly or whatever you, you, you may call it. The, the standards are clearly defined so you can easily find out um, whether your product fits in that. It's incredibly fast, growth rates of 30% plus in, in many of the sectors and, and, and places. There is strong government push, um, there is an incredible sea of opportunities, 1.5 billion square meters um, and there is so many different areas in which you can work that almost for any SME I would say in the sector that's green building there should be there should be yeah. enough space if you approach it well 1.5 billion meters squared of green building yes right yes so there is great opportunities if you find the, the sweet spots and that's not too, of course the if that you have to do your homework uh, and we know that European SMEs have the know-how, they have the experience, they've been building on it in the last 15, 20 years. The Chinese don't have it because there was never a market. Uh, it's a brand and technology market, which means you do not need to compete on price, you need to compete on solution and, and, and what it brings to the customer. Um, you have to enter the market with the right product service. Again, that's not necessarily the product or service in the way that you do it in Europe. Um, and you will probably need partnerships because SMEs are by definition not the biggest companies to approach um, your business. I mean, you can go on the sea with the, with the rowboat, 
maybe it's better to few, find a few people together and buy a bigger boat to get into China. And then, of course, always, 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 there is challenges and risks. There's a lot of know-how and experience. There's a lot of people here to know what to do. Uh, don't make this, the, the, the same mistakes as many others have made uh, and use that knowledge, that, 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 that know-how that has been built up in, in market entry in China. And one of those pieces of know-how, just to remind everybody, is the uh, Green Building Report that uh, Dirk has helped us put together recently, which goes into much more detail into the opportunities and challenges of uh, doing business in this, in this uh, sector, and uh, which has also the information which is uh, highlighted in this webinar as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Dirk. And we're now going to the uh, questions and answers session. We, I'm afraid we've only got uh, two or three minutes left, so perhaps you can go through one or two questions very quickly. One question is on which cities to target. You mentioned before, you know, obviously Beijing, Shanghai um, are the ones, uh, Shenzhen I think also in the south, or Guangzhou area. Um, but do you see that changing? I mean, there were quite a few dark and green areas in the other areas, second tier cities perhaps. Yes. But yeah. what, what's your thoughts about that, especially for European SMEs? Should they be going for those cities first rather than you know, competing with the big boys in the, in the big cities? In 90% in, in of the cases, I would say the first wave is now taking off in the big cities. Okay. Um, and the second wave will copy the big cities. So conquering Chongqing before Beijing is not a way to go forward. And in that sense, the answer is relatively simple. Yep. For about 90% of the SMEs, I would say stopping in Beijing and Shanghai and, and Shenzhen, Guangdong will be the place for you to go. Okay. Um, so it's still early enough on the on the S curve, even it's in the main city. It's still there. early enough on, on the S curve. No, I'm not talking about 100%. You know, there, can be, yeah. there, can, there can be cases and things where there would be a good compelling reason to say climate reason or whatever other reasons, seismic um, reasons yeah. that certain cities are more in need of your products than, than other cities. But in general, um, the first wave is taking off in, in Beijing and Shanghai, and builders will copy whatever has been implemented in Beijing and Shanghai. Okay. And the next question is on ESCOs. You mentioned them before, and then them being a potential opportunity in China as well. Um, previously, they haven't taken off uh, as much as everybody had hoped initially. Has that situation changed in terms of these energy saving companies? Yeah, and in ESCO, I think the, 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 um, the whole ESCO issue is still a bit earlier on the S-curve than the rest of the green building, uh, and that has especially to do with regulations and with uh, business practices. Uh, I mean, you, you can invest, but as long as you're not sure, uh, contractually guaranteed that you will get your money, um, it, it, it will remain a difficult market. So, so most of the ESCOs are now really focusing on industrial sites. Okay. Foreign escrow, especially on foreign sites. But there again, and there you're much further on the S-curve, there in, in, in the ramp-up phase. Um, we see those those escrow services in buildings is still quite early. Okay. Um, they, I would I would advise if, if you want to go into that market, um, carefully study it. You have plenty of time, um, and, and try to experiment with business models. Uh, I think a few years to go before that that takes off. It sounds like all in all, um, this is the right time to enter the market. I think so. For 90% of the people that are involved with green building, uh, this is the time to get into the market. Um, again, it's it's not easy, but many people have done it before. You you can learn from a lot of mistakes, and make sure that you gather enough clusters or power um, to be able to build a bigger boat to sail this vast ocean of opportunity. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Dirk. Um, that's all for the questions for now. We've got a few more others, but we'll try to answer the, all the rest of them by email, and Dirk will be getting back to you uh, through the email system. Um, I'd just like to finish off by thanking Dirk again for his uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation today. My pleasure. And just to remind everybody, just in closing, about the US SME Center and the services we offer. Um, as Dirk said, we are a resource for information on green building as well as many other sectors. Uh, we have expertise in four areas, business development, standards conformity, HR and training, and legal advice. Um, and you can access all our documentation, including the green building report, on our website. And if you want to ask a question 
uh, to any of our experts in these four expert areas or, for example, in, in Dirk's Green Building area, then please feel free to go on our website and hit the Ask the Expert button. Um, we have a whole range of services, webinars and trainings. Today's an example of that. And then we have a whole range of support services as well at the center, including hot desking and uh, matchmaking events and databases. All of these services are ac accessible from our, from our website. Um, this just gives you an overview of the, of the services that we have. Uh, we have a diagnostic kit which will help any USMEs, EUSMEs uh, entering the market and tackles the fundamental questions of entering the Chinese market, such as, for example, carrying out due diligence. I mentioned the report uh, before on knowing your partner in China. That's part four of the diagnostic kit. Um, and then there's a part on uh, the different entry modes. Uh, there's one part on exports into China. And there's one part on the opportunities of doing business in China in, in general. Um, we, we also have the Ask the Experts uh, uh, service as well, as I mentioned before. If you want to ask a question to any of our experts, please go on our website. And uh, you can hit the Ask the Expert button and ask one of the experts a question. Um, also, if you want to sign up for any future training events or work workshops or know about our future webinars, then please uh, sign up on our, on our newsletter, which is also downloadable from our website. Uh, don't forget, and as I'm sure you all know, all know because you've participated in today's webinar, that uh, we have weekly webinars uh, on, uh, on the varying subjects in the different expert areas and in, on different industry sectors as well. Uh, and we've covered over 20 different topics already. So on that note, I'd just like to thank Mr. Dirk Lehrmans again for his very excellent uh, presentation today on how to tap or access the opportunities in the green building sector. And I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for taking the time to take part in our webinar today. Thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank see you, you next time. Thank you.